person's thinking, I need, the, you know, sort of I'm standstill and I have to create movement. No, there's actually a wave of energy that's supposed to be leading your life. And our goal in life, our purpose in life, is not to create the wave, it's to ride the wave, right? to, be, to be a part of that energy. Welcome to Spiritually Hungry, live from LA. Today's episode is about letting go of our need for control and how to make things easier, even effortless. And part of that will be understanding the importance of surrendering. Let's face it though, who doesn't want things to be easier? We talk about hard work, we appreciate hard work, but you know, sometimes we all crave for things just to be easier. So have you ever played or actually solved a Rubik's Cube? I try to think. I know that I once took apart the pieces. I took the stickers back. off too. What a <laughs> cheat. Stickers. I was horrible. No, and stickers. I was so ashamed I threw it away after. <laughs> I wasn't ashamed at all. Because they don't they don't ashamed. actually can never get them back on in a straight way and then they peel well, not off. The stickers. No, that, that's a and terrible the pieces idea. I tried that too. If you would have asked me, I would have told I, you it's a terrible the pieces idea. Off it will also. never look authentic. But if you take the pieces off. I did that too. I remember. And, and then I threw it away also. So I went through two like that. Were you ashamed? Uh no, I just Good. decided Rubik and I were not going to be friends. Um, but if our listeners are anything like we are, most of us, right? You played around with it, you got stuck and maybe gave up. But other people find the solution to it. So well, did I you know? Spent a lot more time. Well, there is <laughs> a really easy to invest into it. trick to solve it. You get a square of four cubes, but I'm serious. Because it's so simple. It's really not that hard. But you buy it. When you buy it, it's all made up. And you never you touch, touch it. it. Yes, exactly. and you pretend you made it. Okay. Well, anyway, there you could do two or three moves, up, down, right, left. I can go through it if you want. Please you don't, don't seem that entertained. <laughs> um, and like that, it's it's solved and it's easy. Is that really true? Yes, it is. There's actually, mm. I think, seven or eight different ways you can solve a Rubik's Cube. I'll be very impressed. Can we can we make a bet? Do you want to take the time to actually do that? No, just make a bet. That I'll buy you a Rubik's Cube and you're I'll mess so, it up. You're so missing the point of what I'm <laughs> okay, saying. Okay, sorry. Okay. So. Which I've seen those diagrams and I couldn't figure them out. It's not a diagram. They now have tutorials. Anyway, the point of my story yes. and my intro here is that we are going to give some cool tips and tools for our getting out of a situation where you feel stuck and where you feel like you don't know which way to go or how to get out or you think it's going to be like this forever. So sit back and relax and get ready to let go of your inner control, listeners and Michael. Surrender. Because we're human, we all like to feel like we're in control, right? I think that is a part of our nature. We try to control our environment, our well, relationships. We think we're in control, right? Yes, but we spend a lot of time trying to control the things that we are involved in in our life, especially we even try to control our thoughts. But the truth is you can't control everything. And the more that we try to do that, it creates more anxiety and more stress, which then creates more lack and, and unfulfillment. Well, the reality is we, we control so little, right? We control so little. Yes. And logically, we probably ask ourselves, do I have the ability to control this? The answer will be no, usually, but it doesn't stop us from trying. And it's a paradox, right, with nature, or the nature of control. Um, there's a TED Talk, actually, by journalist Jill Scherer Murray, and she insists that letting go actually makes you unstoppable in the pursuit of what you truly desire. So what she shared in her story was from ending her 12-year relationship to documenting her weight loss in Shape magazine for 6 million readers, Jill credits all of her success to, success to letting go. In a TEDx talk, she explains how letting go creates space in her life for things she truly wanted. And that's kind of where I want to go with this. Um, I think that's the most important, if I can add. Well, I'm actually like in the middle of um, <laughs> the talking thought? about Jill here. Just, All right, go on with Wait with me, and then you can um, I just you said, add thought. or interrupt. Both. Yes. So as I was saying, what she said <laughs> is that it helped her get present, it helped her get present and allow her to show up in every area of her life as her full authentic self. Suddenly all of the things that she deeply wanted, a committed partnership, the career of her dreams, physical health, begin manifesting in her reality. And this type of letting go she describes isn't the releasing of outer elements of life. She credits five things she let go of and continues to let go of that have created the freedom and joy she currently experiences. So I want to say the five, and I 100% I agree because I've done this. I used to be in that exact same place. And 
it does work. So one is things like letting go of taking things personally. We talk about this often. Two, letting go of what others think also. Three, of needing to be perfect. Four, trying to be something you're funny, not. I've never, I've never felt, had that one. Trying to be perfect? Yeah. Mm. The first two, yeah. But, yeah, sorry. Well, I know why, though, because, and that's kind of leading into something we're going to go into later, but um, I think you always believed in your potential to be great in terms of like being connected like the creator, that you never strived for perfection. Greatness is, is different. But anyway, we'll go into that. So four, trying to be something you're not, and five, letting go of waiting for the right time to do something, like for the time to be right. So you're saying out of any of those... You, I think the one that I the only thing I've struggled with is, is three perfection. Perfection. Um, say them again. I think they're really important. So, I've struggled with uh, all of them. Yeah, I struggled with all the four. It's not that one. So one. Say them again. Say them again. Things like letting go of taking things personally. Two, letting go of what others think. By the way, I think the point is that's a constant battle, right? I, mean, I don't think anybody's completely free of that. I think you're in a continuum. Of yes, getting... and if you really work on it, I think you get to a place where it's more of something you become aware of, and then you you decide what to do with it, rather than it becoming overwhelming or taking over your thoughts and changing your own beliefs by yourself. But so it's a way I, to really get to a think... place where you don't, where you don't, because you know so completely who you are that you know you can't really take it personally. Right, so that's the first. So we're getting sorry. Repeat the first one. Things like letting go of taking things personally. personally. Right. I think I think we, the person can see real, real change in that area if we put our minds to it absolutely. and work on it. Things like getting a, letting go of what others think. Again, that is absolutely possible. I used to care so deeply. Um, and it is possible to chip away at that to get it to a place where you're kind of untouchable in that. Uh, three, of needing to be perfect. Um, absolutely, you can overcome that. You have to realize that perfection is a dead end and it's an impossibility. And you want to you want to aim for for awareness about yourself, information for doing a good enough job. You know, you can be clear about where you ultimately want to arrive to, but that can't be your goal, right? That yeah, can't be where again, you're for me, placing real, I, your effort. You know, energy. I was thinking, one, why why have I uh, not struggled with perfection, perfectionism? Is just because. It's all clear that everything is so much bigger than us, right? So to think that I'm going to be perfect in anything is both comes from a place of I can control certain a lot, right? But also the sense of getting there. I don't think in life you ever get there. It right? implies it's that a you stop growing, exactly. actually, and we don't believe that there's ever Hopefully. an end to that. But again, that takes practice, I think most people, and again, my younger self, it was all about perfectionism because I didn't have that bigger picture understanding. And I felt like, okay, I think most of us, if you achieve this and that's the greatest thing that you can see for yourself, right, then everything becomes about that rather than from your limited perspective, that's all you can be today. But grow you and then your vision of yourself will grow as well. Four, trying to be something you're not. That one I don't feel like I struggled with, to be honest. I tried to be my, I struggled with becoming myself, but I don't know. I guess in really younger ages, they, I, can, I, I, can that, can I can take that them. two ways, right? Because on one level, I think that I'm always, and I think it's a positive thing, trying to be something that I'm not, right? I am who I am today. I want to be somebody better and different and more elevated tomorrow. So life's journey is kind of always trying to be what you're not, but I think it's not, not within the context of, because other people want be, exactly. me to, to be it. So people want me to be in this, this way. That's why I'm strive, trying to fake myself into being that way. As opposed to saying, okay, I don't care what anybody thinks of me, but I do want to be a better version of myself tomorrow. I want to be somebody that I'm not tomorrow, right? So it's an interesting, right. probably a semantical difference. But I think what, what, what she's probably meaning is, is a person who decides to behave or be a certain way because others are, expect them or desire for them to be that way. Right. And it's not really internal to them. Well said. Five, letting go of waiting for the time to be right. And that, I really, I did that with my books. And, you know, I, I can't publish this then because it's not the right time. I should have published it earlier. That was a better time. It's all about, and I think it's a way we self-sabotage. I can't really do this now because, and fill in the blank, it could be because my family depends on me or because 
um, I'm too young, I'm too old, I don't know, I don't have the means, I don't understand how to do it, or you can just decide that time is an illusion also. Yeah, and, I remember, I'm not, I'm not sure if I shared this story, but I think for me, it, at, actually this ties back to perfectionism. So I remember many years ago, maybe now, 20, 25 years ago, I was working on this book, and it was a very important book, and I worked in it for years, I was ready, I wrote, wrote this lengthy commentary on, on these, these letters from my father's teacher to him, and I was working it, working and working it. And then I remember waking up once from a sleep, and I just felt this, like this weight on me. I said, I can't, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be, in my eyes, you know, the way I would ultimately want it to be. I just have to get it out. And I decided to, to publish it you know, right then and there. And of course, it took a few weeks, months for it to get published. But I think that's, for me, maybe that's where perfectionism comes in. When you're doing a project, or you're thinking about a project, but for me, when you're in the middle of a project, when is the time to sort of pub, to publish it or to, to let it let it go? And the reality is that you know you don't want to rush important things, but you don't want to delay important things. Sort of that sweet spot of 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 getting things done. But I think most people, most of us, we wait where, especially if something is important to us, we want to wait and wait and wait, even after we've started it, to get it, for it to get better and better and better. And the reality is that no, it's never going to be perfect. The next one might be, you know, I often when you listen to authors, writers, good writers speak, they always say, you know, they, they will never read something that they, you know, if they've been writing for 20 years, they'll never, they hate what they wrote their first, the yeah. first book, the second book, the third book. And I think it's a good view, which is, yeah, I'm going to publish something. And it's not going to, and, and five years from now, I'll probably look back and say, oh, I can't believe I wrote that. But, uh, but by, because I published it five years ago, the one I published today, I'm going to be so excited about it and I'm so happy with. And then, by the way, five years from now, I'm going to look back on what I published today or whatever. I, this isn't just about publishing, anything that I do in life. And then I'll look back and say, I can't believe I published that five years ago. But I'm so happy with what I did today. And I think that's, that's like the perfect pace of life. You do it, it's not going to be perfect. You get, but because you're doing it, you get better at doing it the next time, and the next time, and the next time. Right. Most people don't believe that that's the case. That that they'll do better and better. They're like, this is the only book I'll ever write, or that second one, or whatever. It's funny because I opened one of my books today, and I read something. And I was like, huh, that feels unfinished. I would write it differently today because I realized that the way I see it now has even evolved. Right. That message. So I was actually surprised that that literally came up to, for me earlier today. Um, but I think that you hit on something. So you wouldn't call it perfectionism, but I think that project for you was such an important, important book that that, and you felt responsible that you were going to get it out. So you wanted to be the best, and I think you're struggling with like, is it good enough, or can it be better, right? And that's still kind of the same thing. And the more we care about something, obviously, the more we hold on in that way. You can call it try to control it, or but we stay stuck because we don't know the potential of what it could become. Right, and also. Like I said, it's it's kind of struggling through the sweet sweet spot because it's going to be an iterative process, right? So so what? And and I think this is a process that I go through not just in create in writing or or anything creative, but also in 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 ideas and 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 thoughts that we have about you know doing things in the world or even as I'm you know we're running organ the organization and it's always that balance. Being, you, know, you don't want to do things too quickly, but you don't want to do things too slowly. And I know I'm going to do it, and it's not going to be as it should be perfectly. Hopefully, it'll be sixty percent of it, and the next time it'll be seventy. And next next time it'll be eighty. But I think that's. I think we want to train ourselves, and certainly for our listeners, to be thinking in that way. That yeah, you don't want to rush into things. You don't want to do th- two things too too quickly. But you also have to be careful not doing too, things too slowly, because then you wind up not being doing them. But more importantly, you're not allowing yourself the process of getting better at it. And if you go into it saying. This is not going to be perfect. This is going to be hopefully X percent of the way but there. At least there's movement. Exactly. So all of these things that we said, what do they have in common? They're all ways that we're trying to control and control things that are inherently out of our control. Right? That's the big solution. Exactly. So letting go doesn't mean giving up your autonomy. It means that you surrender to the process, and even ultimately the outcome, right? You put your energy, effort everywhere, but you really understand that you, everything is about what you learn in the journey along the way. Absolutely. And I think, and I was thinking about it because I, even when I'm preparing a lecture or something to share, for me, it's, it's in the, in, I think in the beginning, you know, 
30 years ago, I was always trying to make this lecture, you know, perf- perfect, right? I think that's where uh, yeah, the so most amazing. struggle with it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess I was lying in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, and, and it also really mattered to me how it was received. But over time, where I've gotten with this, which I'm, I'm, I'm happy with, is that I do want it to be impactful, and I do, I do want it to be what it's supposed to be, right? Not what I want it to be, what it's supposed to be. And then, honestly, how it's received, I could almost care less. I don't know if I can care less. I could say I completely care less, but, but I can almost care less. Because if I'm doing the right thing, then it doesn't even matter how, how it's received or how people re- well, react to it. I can relate it. to that. I mean, anybody who saw me lecturing in the early days, I would prepare a big binder, and I would over-prepare, over-prepare, hours still and hours. still over Better. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I don't prepare at all. I really just, I play around yeah. with it. Sometimes I don't prepare at all. Like, I'm just going to go with what I feel in that moment. Those feel better, actually, to be honest, because I feel like I'm really tapped into something I'm feeling in that moment. And then, of course, when you express from that place, it's completely different because I'm feeling inspired and feeling connected, right? Um, but in those early days, so it was like three weeks out of my life preparing for 40 minutes. And these big binders, and I'd read from it because I felt like the way I wrote it was better than the way I could deliver it. And I wanted to make sure everybody got the message. And oh my God, all that pressure. But it was a painful process. But probably but, necessary. But it was it. necessary for me getting to the place where I'm at now on many levels for many different reasons. Um, and that's sorry, that's a perfect example for our listeners, right? Because you had two choices. And I still have the binders just to remind me of like that. <laughs> but, but, but as you were going through that process, you could have said, oh, well, wait, maybe I'm not ready to lecture. Maybe I'll wait five years until I don't need the binders, right? No, I couldn't. Right? But the right thing was to, to do it in a way that maybe was painful for you. Do it. Get to the next level. Do it. Get to the next level. I mean, it was painful each time. Well, the first time I lost so much weight because I was like so nervous. The second time well, I stayed I up all night lectures, then. <laughs> the night before to prepare it. Um, after the three weeks, even then I did it all night. And then it got less and less to the point where now it's it's not that way, but it's, oh yeah. It but I think, this, I, I think there's a really, really important point that I want to stress for our listeners related to everything we just said. And that is that the way we're supposed to view our lives Right? It's not that I am going to do, I am going to manifest, I am going to create. There is a whole energy, we call it the light of the Creator, there is a system. And really what it is, is that you are riding the wave of life, rather than I am creating, I am creating, I am doing. And so, for, for example, I will give this example, because I think it is so important, because it is a real consciousness shift from where most people are at. A person's working, a person's writing, a person's thinking, I need, the, you know, sort of I'm standstill and I have to create the movement. No, there's actually a wave of energy that's supposed to be leading your life. And our goal in life, our purpose in life, is not to create the wave, it's to ride the wave, right? to, be, to be a part of that energy. So I'll give an example, which I thought for me personally really inspired me. So when I, for instance, prepare a lecture or something that I'm going to share, for me, the question isn't, you know, I don't start from a point of what am I, you know, create out of, you know, out of nothing. I'm going to create a lecture. Sort of, my, what is I, I ask myself? What what does the creator want me to share? What is that energy in the world? And then from there, yes, of course, I study, and yes, of course, I write, and yes, of course, I have a, a process by which I do it. But I know that it's. I hope that it, that it is less me and me and me and more me tapping into what exists. You know, you know, you hear artists all the time talk about this. You know, um, I just heard recently, you know, Chris Martin from Coldplay say, you know, he literally he does not write music. He literally is gifted. He doesn't know from where, right? We'll say from the light of the creator, right? And he, he just and then he gets a, a, a whole song in a second, and then he he he, he writes he downloads, he, yeah. he downloads it. and that's that li- all life is supposed not, not just creative processes, right? Life is supposed to be like that. As we raise our kids, as we're in a relationship. As we work, it's all supposed supposed to be tapped in to that flow of life, and when you not just understand that because it's not an, not a, simply an intellectual understanding, it's a way of life. It really becomes a way of life. So I'll give an example. I found this very inspiring, and I got this message like just in the past two days. So this past Saturday, I gave a lecture, and of course I won't go into it. It's I spoke about the two things that I want to. There's a verse that I quoted. Um, regarding the biblical Gideon, where the the voice the the Creator said to him, "Go with your strength." Lech that was the verse. 
That was one thing. The other thing, Gideon went into battle with 300 soldiers. It's a whole story. I won't go into it. But those were two phrases. So we were staying here in LA in an apartment. And as I, that Saturday morning, as I was coming to the center, to where I was going to give the lecture, I, uh, I was thinking about the lecture. And somebody told me, one of our teachers said that he was walking. He lives next door to us. As he was walking, suddenly the number 300 came into his mind. And he has no idea from where it came mm-hmm. in. Today, I get a text from one of our teachers in Israel that he was doing a spiritual connection. He had not heard my lecture. And suddenly, that verse from Gideon, go with your strength, came to him. Mm. And then he saw the lecture. Very cool. And the idea for me is, the, the reason why I find that so inspiring, because that means that, that I wasn't creating a lecture, right? I was tapping into an energy, and that energy existed and exists, and I was flowing with that. So, these two things, right? The understanding that, that I am not the creator, right? I am not the one that is uh, fully necessary to create, which is, again, I think, and I hope I'm expressing this properly, I think most people think, I'm at a standstill. Creation will only happen if I do it. I push it forward. We're, all that. Whether, again, whether as a parent, whether as a spouse, whether as a creator, whether a creative being, whether in any in all parts of my life. But if you really understand that life is flowing, you know, they, they talk about this, and we've mentioned some of our podcasts, that state of flow. But what it is is that the light of the creator is flowing through me, it's flowing through you, it's flowing through the world. And I just want to tap into that. Also, if you think about it this way, there's nothing new under the sun, right? We we come in and we take ourselves so seriously, and then also not seriously at all, right? Then that stops us from actually achieving things and believing that we can. But we stand on the shoulder of giants. Anything that we are all creating, really, especially if you're doing something that is impactful, has been created before. We might have variations of it. We might tap into the same energy or essence of it. But how foolish it is to really take ourselves so seriously to the point where we actually don't manifest. We completely stay stuck because we're taking ourselves so seriously. I have to be the one to figure this out. To do. No, you actually don't. You seem to tap into a frequency that already exists, that has always existed, that will continue to exist. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, how do I become the most powerful conduit for that energy? Most tapped in. And I would say, and I think this is so important. I, I, I know you have a lot more to share. I have a little bit more to share. I don't want to end the podcast yet, but honestly, if our listeners just left... I don't mind. I have some other things to do. <laughs> um, just nothing more enjoyable than recording this podcast. Um, how, that life should be a pursuit of, of tapping in to that flow that's already there. And the sim- this maybe the simplest thing to do is, is every time you're about to do something important, just stop for a second before and say, I don't want to be writing this. I don't want to be the, the only force creating this. I don't want to be the only force parenting my child, if it's an important conversation. I want to connect myself to that. We call it the light of the creator. You can call it the flow of the universe, or whatever, whatever you want to refer to it as. But to know that it exists, and that as I live, and as I live through life, and as I do important things, it's not up to me. Well, that is my mantra before I speak, before I, even when the kids ask difficult questions that I feel like, depending on how I answer this, is really going to influence them because it's such a big question or or standstill that they're at. And I ask the Creator to speak through me and that I ask to be the most amazing conduit channel for the light of the Creator possible. And I remind myself, sure, prepare, study, yes, but you... You know, for me, that was, by the way, when I started to do that, that's when the preparation really stopped because I realized how foolish that was. Yes, I need to study and I learn and be inspired myself. That's like, what, 10%, 20%, and the rest really needs to come from from above. I just had an interesting thought. And, uh, um, you know, I think one of the reasons people fear death is because we live a life where we think, I need to create every moment. So I'm creating my book, I'm creating my child, I'm creating my relationship. So if it's all up to me, then what, who's going to be creating it then, right? But if you live a life that you're flowing with the light to the Creator, then... Who's going to create the experience of that? Right. What, if I, I, I'm not going to be there, I'm not going to have the strength once I'm no longer in this body. What do you think, depend on then? Who's going to be doing at it? At that right? stage of... Exactly. Yeah. Whereas if you live a life that's really in connection with that flow of light, and the energy that is, and you experience that all the time when you're writing a book, when you're teaching, when you're with your children, when you with your spouse, then it starts to make, oh, well, that flow is going to continue. It doesn't end when the when the when the when the soul leaves the body. But again, if 
you go through life thinking everything's at a standstill and I need to be creating every moment, then yeah, well, who's going to be creating that moment after after a person dies? So I think, as it, not that this is necessarily the point of this podcast, but I think living in this state or really bringing ourselves, uh, practicing living in this state also begins to open up an understanding of, of how the soul continues to flow even after it, um, even after it leaves the body. So I think the first step and tool that's necessary in order to get to this place is surrendering. And I just want to unpack that a little bit because surrender sounds like a horrible word. Like, I want to surrender to what? What am I surrendering to? So surrendering doesn't mean giving up. It means giving over your energy to what's within your control. It means reacting in ways that support your growth when life unfolds in unexpected ways. So, sorry, say that again. The whole thing. Well, I, I didn't get it, so I'm not sure there are Surrendering listeners. doesn't mean giving up. It means giving over your energy to what's within your control. And then you're wondering what's within your say, control. Yes, yeah, so say that. Yeah, I don't know. Well, let me unpack it. Yes, okay. It means reacting in ways that support your growth when life unfolds in unexpected, way, unexpected ways. So that means being able to adjust positively, positively to unexpected events in our lives. It means being flexible. It means maintaining a sense of humor and retaining our certainty that life is happening for us, not to us. So our life is unfolding exactly as it is. It means that you don't worry and you don't question, right? You go into that flow state. But I do want to read a section from my book, Fears on an Option, from when I really understood what surrendering was and practiced that. And then if you have questions, honey, <laughs> then you can ask me. No, everything makes all the sense Does in the world it? to me right now. Okay, so I'm not going to go... I'm not, there you go. I'm not going to go into the whole part of this. If you want to hear the whole really juicy, amazing story, you can buy Fear is Not an Option. Oh, yes, yes. Let me, and let me, read let me chapter... Sorry, before you start. Start at let the me, be- Let me have all of our listeners, if you have not, if you have not yet read, purchased... Fear is not an option. Pause the podcast right now. Go to Amazon. Order you for yourself five or ten copies to give to all of your friends as well. Of mm-hmm. fear is not an option, and uh, only then press play. Press play again. So you can start. What page? Chapter nine at the beginning of it. I'm going to pick up towards the end. So I'm in the middle of giving birth to our third child, Miriam, and um, what was a theme for uh, those three pregnancies and deliveries. This wasn't the natural birth I had uh, decided it would be. There were some complications. So I'll pick up here. Later, I was told my heart rate and my daughter's heart rate had dropped dangerously low. At this point, through the haze of medication, I was at a place that I felt like at a dead end. And in that, I found a gentle clarity. I knew that the assistance I needed was going to come from somewhere far greater than a doctor, anesthesiologist, or hospital. I looked up from my hospital bed to the ceiling and I whispered to the creator, I'm yours. I surrender to you completely. I trust you. Whatever should be, should be. I didn't want to leave this world that day, but I was ready for whatever was meant to be. I felt total certainty and trust. Surrender is not about giving in or giving up. It's the act of not knowing an outcome and putting yourself in the hands of the creator. I am yours. It was the first time I experienced true surrender, and it was the most blissful feeling of freedom I have ever felt in my life. I was no longer attached to anything. I wasn't ruled by anything, and I wasn't fearful of anything. I just was. It's the purest, highest expression to which we can aspire, and it's available to every single one of us in any moment. Two minutes later, into my surrender, Miriam was born. Beautiful. And I think that that's it in a nutshell, right? And it is, it feels, right? Because surrendering, again, sounds unappealing, but when you really experience it, and true surrender really is leaning into the only truth that is, and that is the creator and where we come from, you find this peace that you've never known before. Beautiful. Do you, by the way, you, you mentioned the song that, you were, that was playing while Miriam was born in the book? Wasn't it a uh, Coldplay song? Yeah, Scientist. I think it's called Scientist. Uh-huh. So it's funny because me and Miriam were just in the car. It was fine. We were in the car this week. Wait, this sing week. it for me? How does it go? Come on. Um, Da, 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 Kingdom Come? No, that's not. Nobody said it, it was, was easy. easy. Yes. No one ever said it would, it be, would this be hard. So, hard. Like so it's funny, we were yeah, I think to that's the... when we turned it off at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but the, maybe that's exactly when she was born. But the point is that that um, 
uh, me and Miriam were listening to that song, I think it was last week or this week, in the car, and I mentioned to her, and she already knew this somehow, that that was the song that she was Oh, did she? To. Yes. I guess I might have told her yes. before. So, I think it's such an important point. You know, I was thinking about it, as, as children, children surrender all the time, right? When a, when a child is learning to, to, to walk even, right? But certainly when they're learning to ride a bike, there's fear, right? They, they, they have to surrender to an unknown. Maybe it's smaller than, you know, death, clearly. But the only way we learn, really learn new things, is when we're able to surrender what we were attached to, and what we were holding on to, and learn a new thing. And children do this all the time. Well, children, I don't know if they have that. I mean, isn't it because they don't know better? They don't know. I mean, well, it's I think not, they're more they tapped And they also in, don't know that they're, they don't have doubt in their ability to become. It's still a surrender of a past to, to a new future. Anything that they learn, they go to a new school, right? They go to university, right? They, they just finish. Well, a, I'm talking about, you know, learning to walk and this and that. You're but all those, I'm, ta- I'm talking about all the new experiences of growing up. Right? Whether it's learning to walk at one to two years old, whether it's learning to ride a bike at five to eight years old, whatever that is, all those are the only way those processes are possible. Right? Imagine a child says, you know, I know walking on two feet, I know driving a car with four wheels, two wheels too scary, I don't know how this is done, I, I'm just not doing it. Right? So all real life change, small or big, no matter how you want to view it, is only through surrender. Unfortunately, as we grow up, we get stuck and we're not really willing to surrender and i think one of the important lessons in life and it's scary i actually it's funny i was having a conversation with somebody who was who's been married for a long, a long time <laughs> and and she was saying that she's never been happy in her marriage mm. <laughs> and and i said so in all these for a long time like over 50 years in all these years, did you never want, why did you ever have the thought to leave? Right? It, it was unpleasant from day one. It's been unpleasant for the past 50 years. And the answer was very simple, fear. I'm afraid of being alone. And I think, you know, obviously that's, a, that's an extreme example, but I think what holds us back is our inability to surrender. To, uh, to surrender, why to surrender? Why to surrender to, to the unknown? Because the unknown is not the unknown. The unknown is the flow of the light of the Creator. And I think that's the connection to what we were saying before. And, and if we understand that our attachment to so many things is actually what is limiting us to, to really living the life that we're meant to live. Because in this, I was very sad when I had this conversation, because of course every one of us is meant to have love in our lives. And, and what, what holds people in this case, but I think in all cases, what holds us back is that fear. We call it the fear of the unknown or the fear of being, being alone. But all that means is that I don't believe that there is a flow of energy. We call it the light of the creator that exists. And because even if, if you some did, people do believe there is. They don't think it applies to them. Yeah, a lot of people maybe. are like, yeah, they're, you know. But for me, you know, I can't tell you many times people who do really believe in everything we're saying, but they're like, I don't know. I'm I'm begging to God. Why don't you not care about me? I mean, it's like to that level. And it stops people from. Yeah. And can, can I share a story? Sure. So, one of my I favorite. I love when you ask me permission. As if, first of all, as if I'm going to say no. Sometimes you've said And second no. of all, usually you just interrupt. So, like, <laughs> why are you asking me? Oh, I don't think that's true, but okay. Um, so, the story goes back to the great Kabbalist, the Baal Shem Tov. And the story goes, it's a relatively long story, but I think it's beautiful and very instructive and hopefully inspiring for our listeners. Um, he, he would travel with his students, and uh, one day they traveled to this little town. And they come into this house of a very poor family, a couple. And the Baal Shanta sits down, and they recognize him as a very holy man, a spiritual man. They say, can we bring you some drinks, some food? And he says, yeah, I'm actually starving, starving. These people obviously don't have a lot of money. They don't have a lot of food. And he starts, they start bringing food to the table. He kept eating, eating, and drinking. Everything they bring to the table. Eating them out of house and home, everything. And literally. The last thing they had left is a cow that... Would supply they would supply them with milk that they would then sell for a few kopecks and then they would live off of that. That was their only way of living, of livelihood. He says, "I mean, I really would like to eat some meat. Do you have any meat?" So the husband and wife go into the kitchen. They have this conversation. What are we going to do? I mean, the only thing we have is the cow. If we slaughter the cow and serve it to him, then we're not going to have any any way to live. They go back and forth. They say, "But he's a holy man, a spiritual man. 
He's asking for this. Let's do it. So they go ahead. They slaughter the cow. They cook the meat. Not only does he eat the meat, he eats everything. Like, like doesn't leave them even one piece of meat. So they're hungry also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they have no, they, they, they're literally eating them out of livelihood and every scrap of food left. His students who are around are very surprised, but they, don't, they know not to ask. They leave. The Baal Shantav and the students leave. A number of years later, they're walking in their town of Mezbaz, where the Baal Shantav lived. Suddenly, this beautiful carriage, gold and you know, really ornate, drives by. And the, as the Baal Shantav is walking on the side of the street, the carriage stops. And the man, a man opens up the door to the carriage. The, the wealthy man, obviously, from inside the carriage, walks out, comes and he hugs the Baal Shem Tov. And as they're hugging, the Baal Shem Tov turns to his students, he says, do you recognize this man? And none of those students recognize him. He says, this is, you remember a number of years ago, we were traveling together, and I went to a home, and I had the food, and I asked for, for meat, and they served me the meat. This is the man. And he asked the man, what happened? He tells him a whole story of how he came upon, he started working, and he came upon different miracles that really opened up the gates of wealth for him. And the Mashallah turns to the student and says, you know, this man was destined to be wealthy. But because he had that scrawny cow, and he held on to it for dear life, because that literally he thought that was the only way he'll continue to survive, he was closed to all the great wealth that was waiting for him. And therefore, I had to go there and make sure that that last thing that he, was holding, he and his wife were holding on to, that was actually not giving them the life they're supposed to have, but was keeping them stuck and jailed in a small life. I had to take that away from them in order to open for them the ability to live the life that they're meant to live with great wealth. Did it build desire? Well, not only desire, but, but the holding on to the old reality, in this case the cow, is what didn't allow them to enter into new reality. Mm-hmm. And there's a phrase, and I've spoken about this recently, Abraham, the great biblical patriarch, really the, one of the first spiritual leaders, he, he, would, he would refer to himself, he would say, I am ashes and dirt. Those are the two words that he used. And <clears throat> the Kabbalists explained that ashes represent something that once existed, no longer does. You take a table, once was a table, you burn it, it becomes ashes. It, once was a, it has a past, but no future. You can't do anything with ashes. Dirt, earth, represents currently no past, no present, but endless possibility for the future. From the earth, from the dirt, you can make palm trees, and you can create any type of vegetation. You can create literally endlessly. Abraham was telling us that every one of us has the possibility of entering into a future that is limitless. But in order to enter into a future that's limitless, we have to make the past sometimes the present, ashes. And that's what the Baal Shanta was teaching his students, and this is the lesson for us. So surrender isn't just about, you know, giving up. It's the understanding that, and we're talking here about money, but it's not about money. It's about anything. It's about a relationship like we just spoke about before. It's about joy. We are meant to be going towards a future with limitless wealth, joy, relationships. But too often, because of our desire not to surrender our past or present. We keep ourselves jailed in a small future, when in reality what it's meant to be coming to us is this great limitless future. I mean, people think that everything that they have attained to a certain age, right, that that's all it will ever be, that that's the best it will be. Even if they kind of daydream about something more, they think, look, at least I have this. It's the biggest way we get stuck and get fooled into thinking. And so there could be blessings waiting right outside your doorstep. You're not even They are. To I, see I them. promise you they are. That's the point. The, the beautiful and exciting reality is that there actually are. But unless we're... No, I mean, so many people, like, you know, looking for love, and where's my soulmate? And, you know, they just never think it's there for them. They don't think it's available for them in this lifetime. None of the great things that they desire. Right. But in reality, as we're saying, is that if you're first understanding that this limitless flow that you're supposed to be riding is there for you. You just have to tap into tap it. into it and let go. Let go. Surrender. There, every one of us has to surrender different things. But if you don't surrender, I was going to say all of that, or at least some of that, then you can't enter into that new future. And that's why I think for me, and I, I know for you, 
one of the exciting things about tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow is the is, is that I don't want tomorrow to be a continuation of today, but just a little bit better, or even status quo. I know that tomorrow can be so much better on so many levels, and that is what I am looking forward to. And only with that type of consciousness will you be able to discover that great future that you are meant to have. So, if we could leave our listeners with a final thought, we all have a variety of reasons for getting into and staying in any given situation or reality. But in truth, it is the very thought or behavior that got us into the situation that often keeps us there. We may think we are stuck in a situation because we feel sadness, guilt, betrayal, jealousy, fear, but emotions are not what keep us stuck. It is the lack of action, follow through, consistency, certainty, and inability to surrender that does. So, and we did not even go into emotions, and I do not really want to unpack that. Our emotions are indicators of what is going on in our minds and what is going on in our souls and how we feel about them. But behind any emotion is a thought, and the thought can change about the situation. So, I think internalize everything that we said, act on it. But really, I think you have to start with asking yourself what you think really about surrender and what you really think about the possibilities that are available to you. And if you don't believe that they are, that is the first place to start because you can listen to everything we said in this podcast, but nothing's really going to change until your thoughts do. Yeah, which is, is something I literally shared that today with somebody, the fact that not everything that we think about can happen, but what we think can happen won't happen. And that's the point, exactly. at least open, begin to open yourself up to the possibility that there's limitless joy, limitless blessings waiting for you. It is interesting because when I started studying Kabbalah, I think before that time, I did not buy into what everybody else believed around me and that this is as good as it gets. I did not, but I did not know, you know, I did not know how to, how to see anything else, how to live anything else. And when I found this wisdom and I found the Kabbalah Center, it opened my mind and my eyes and my experience into like, it is almost like I was transported to a completely different realm. And then once I tasted it, then I understood that it was possible. Once I understood it was possible, then I knew that the onus was on me to create that and create a life for myself that mirrored that, right? So I think, again, you have to know it for yourself. You have to, you have to know that it is waiting for you. Absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you. So I would like to share with our listeners a review that one of our listeners shared on Apple Podcasts, as we always inspire our listeners to know that we read all of your reviews, we read all, all of your emails. So, this is um, titled Life Changing. Monica and Michael, thank you so much for making this wisdom easy and accessible. I'm making my way out of my own prison, and listening to your podcast is one of my most powerful life jackets. Whether it's in my shower, walking down the Hudson River, or at my craft table, I'm always in a better place while and after I give you my ears. Mm. God bless you both. The knowledge you share is priceless, and I've gained so much. I love that. Never stop. So thank you for writing that. Thank I you love for all the sharing places we that. Go. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the places you'll go. So it's a great time to remind our listeners. Please make sure to continue to send your stories, questions, topic ideas, comments, inspirations to Monica and Michael at spirituallyhungry.life Monica and Michael at spirituallyhungry.life As always, please continue to share this podcast with everybody you know. Go to Apple Podcasts, write five-star reviews. I hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as we enjoyed recording it. Stay spiritually hungry. <laughs>